So I've got the last talk about um, legislation and regulation, so it can be a fairly dry subject, but I'll make it um, as interesting as we can. Let me change the screen. Oh, there we are. Um, so first of all, starting with an image, because that's obviously what we all want to do. So all the legislation I'll talk about is designed to kind of allow us to get these images that we want at the end of it. However, there's obviously radiation risks um, to the patient as well as to staff and public have been using ionizing radiation. So Matey's already um, discussed some of the issues around that. So we'll go into a bit more detail about the different um, types of legislation that there are. But essentially nuclear medicine is a very highly regulated um, modality. So within um, just nuclear medicine, there's a whole range of different um, pieces of UK legislation. Some of it differs for devolved nations, but broadly these are um, the items. And so we have the ionizing radiation regulation 2017. They're um, looked after by the HSE, Health and Safety Executives. And within your hospital or institution, you have what's called a Radiation Protection Advisor or RPA. They're the ones that can advise you on compliance to that specific um, regulation. We also have the Ionizing Radiation Medical Exposure Regulations 2017 or ERMA 17. This involves um, advice from the medical physics expert or MPE. Um, and it's kind of enforced by the CQC, but it also involves RSAC, which you've heard a bit about today, and I'll talk a bit more later. And that's one of the hats that I wear um, for the Oxford hospitals here. There's also um, the environmental permitting regulations, which run to over 300 pages, um, or EPR 2016. And you're kind of the institutional hospitals giving advice to those from your radioactive waste advisor, and they're enforced by the environment agency who come in um, generally about once a year and inspect your hospital um, to check you're complying to their regulations. And all these different um, enforcement agencies can kind of issue um, notices to kind of suggest you can improve, give you suggestions, all the way through to they can kind of take you to court and find the hospital if you aren't complying to the regulations. So it can be bad for your bank balance if, if you don't comply. And lastly, um, if you transport um, radioactive material, there's the Casualty Dangerous Goods Act, use of transport um, regulations, and for that you have the Dangerous Goods Safety Advisor, and that's um, regulated by the Office for Nuclear Regulation. So where do you kind of know who your different advisors are? So within your institution, they should um, let you know. Um, for RPA, cyber RIAs and MPs, there's this body called RPA 2000 that basically uh, keeps a list of all the people that are um, allowed to act as these sorts of advisors. So you kind of click on the link and it gives you a list of all, in this case, 247 different RWAs that are within the UK. So you can kind of check that you're legitimate and allowed to give advice and it gives you your expiry date. And all of these things, they last about five years, then you have to uh, renew them. So I did that, finished that last weekend. And um, so my large um, portfolios, so you kind of have to do an evidence of what you've done in the last five years for giving that advice. It gets sent off to different assessors um, who then decide whether or not you've done enough kind of um, CPD, enough uh, professional practice to maintain that accreditation for the next five years. Um, and it runs to kind of over 100 pages. It's a lot, a large document to put together, really. Um, so within the um, institution, um, in terms of IRR 17, uh, which kind of mainly focuses on staff exposures with um, lots of imagery modalities like X-ray, CT, when you're not taking that picture, the, there's no kind of risk, the X-ray beam isn't on. Whereas with nuclear medicine, it's a little bit different. Once you've injected that patient, they themselves are radioactive and stay radioactive. And um, so you have to be careful um, what A, why you're injecting and how you do that. And, but also once the patients finish their um, medical imaging, when they go home, you give advice for how they can be with their, um, whoever they might live with. Um, and also they go through the hospital, what precautions they have to take. The different ways that we kind of can prevent contamination. Um, so you've seen a bit about the different things that are in ready pharmacies. Um, and we're all used to with COVID times now, all different PPE, but essentially it's the same sort of thing to protect yourself against any kind of spillage of radiation, using different like a mask or gloves typically are overshoes depending on the area that you're in and the risk that and that particular red nuclide is will determine what PPE is necessary for you. As Matrix already mentioned, the, the key bits are time distance shielding within nuclear medicine. Um, distance is kind of the easiest one, you just take a step back and inverse square law, you reduce it a lot, um, but you also use um, shielding as appropriate. So for example, when we treat, um, Edith mentioned about molecular radiotherapy treatments, when we treat um, therapy patients on the ward, um, they're actually within um, uh, lead-lined rooms. So therefore when 
people go and see them to check on them. They're protected because there's lead uh, between you and that patient um, to reduce um, the staff members' exposure. And again, if you've got a um, patient with radiation, the bigger your kind of distance from them. So here, if you're really close, you get sort of half a millisievert per hour. Go up to two meters, it goes down to 0.03 millisieverts per hour. So you can really reduce your exposure um, just by taking a step back. Another aspect to be careful with in terms of contamination is on your skin. So it's always very important to monitor yourself regularly, as has already been mentioned, um, both when you kind of handle injections or even radioactive waste. Um, to ensure there's nothing that happens to this poor person here where they've got some issue on the skin, they didn't realise it. And if you don't realise at the time, um, some of the radiation can be quite damaging to your, your skin. Or even if you have an accident like here, you can see this is um, smashed into this um, transport document, which then in transport box, which in theory could then leak some radiation down onto the floor here. So the way to prevent this is simply um, use PPE, follow the, the rules that are in that particular place um, and if you do find any contamination just um, wash it off as quickly as possible um, and you can kind of reduce the time you have been contaminated by regular monitoring. You can see as you kind of wash hands regularly you kind of reduce the amount of techniques that you um, have on your hand. So that's um, about IRR so moving on to the environmental permitting regulations um, so this act uh, regulates the accumulation use keeping and disposal of radioactive substances so you have different permits, both for open sources, which are the sources you might inject into patients, as well as sealed sources, which are typically used to kind of check scanners, how they're performing that Edith mentioned earlier. Within um, our permit, it specifies the exact um, rate nuclei that you're allowed to keep on site, um, as well as the amount of radioactivity you're allowed to both hold and discharge um, and hold as waste. So there's different categories for how you can um, store your radioactive products. So you need to make sure that everything you're holding or ordering is within those different categories. So if you're setting up a research trial, you need to be sure that the site you want to do the, that research trial on have that specific isotope on their license um, because it's needed for them to be able to do those um, treatments, deliver that diagnostic test. There's also very strict um, requirements of um, theft and damage to sources, particularly the sealed sources. And you will get inspections by the police as part of that as well. However, um, as I said, if you have a um, research trial which needs a new radionuclide, or alternatively, it's, if it's using a lot more um, radioactivity than you typically would use for your normal clinical practice, then you have to do a permit variation. And this can take a lot of time to um, vary. You have to produce a lot of different documents, a lot of um, procedures have to be sent off to the EA for them to assess and determine if, you're, if they consider you're safe to increase your um, permit limits. And as part of that, you have to do an environmental assessment. So obviously any patients that we treat in Oxford, um, when they go home, will discharge any radiation that isn't kind of attached to them, um, typically through their urine. So that goes out to the sewage plant. We have to keep um, an eye on what we discharge in Oxford, but also other um, private institutions or universities within Oxford that go to the same sewage plant. So a project I did many, many years ago, um, over a decade now, was looking at the um, radioactivity levels in the treated effluent. So after we the water has been through the sewage plant, um, sewage plant treats it, spits it out into this um, little brook that then goes off onto a hotel nearby. So it's like the pretty little brook in the river, but it's basically just pure um, sewage water that's been treated. So we were monitoring with a bucket and in this case, computer cable thrown in to collect our different water samples to see and what radiation levels we were detecting in the brook. And this is part of our kind of application to the EA to allow us to um, treat more patients. This is our kind of proof of how we could do this. So that was kind of the initial way we did it. Um, and then we were able to loan a much better system. So rather than me clambering on this uh, riverbank to chucking a bucket in, um, we could have this device here, which was um, basically an automated uh, water sampling that the EA used for kind of assessing water quality throughout the UK. And with this device, you basically, it's like a it's like telephone banking. You ring it up, say, I want you to start counting at this point. Press one to start counting, press two for stopping counting. So you kind of tell it to go. And then every couple of hours, it would take a sample automatically, install all the bottles and for us in this little tub. So then what we could do is we could compare the patients on the ward. Um, we measured their aeration levels regularly. So we could tell when they went to the loo. 
and we can measure the, uh, which is this pink, pink line here, and the patient on the ward, in this case, an iodine patient. Then we measure the iodine levels within the um, treated effluent as it's about to leave the sewage pipe into the brook. So you can see you kind of get a little spike, uh, basically a day or so after your um, iodine patient enters the ward. So therefore we can kind of can measure as the patients in the ward, they go to the loo, a day or so later, you can measure that kind of spike of radiation smeared out um, as it leaves the sewage plant. Um, and in terms of your kind of permit creation, you have to model all these different things. In this case, have to calculate what the sewage treatment worker would get, what the farming family, children playing the brook, angler family, all these different categories. You have to kind of prove to the EA that the your increase of kind of use of uh, red nuclides at your site won't adversely affect any of these specific groups in terms of the environmental assessment. So you can see there's quite a lot of work and modeling that has to go into um, getting these um, different permeate variations approved. So if you do want to add a new rate nuclide or increase what you want to do, it's good to kind of talk to sites early and get this process going as soon as possible because it, it takes many months to get it all together and get it kind of approved. It also costs quite a bit. I think it's like several thousand pounds, about seven thousand pounds, I think, to do a complete variation just for the EA A cost. So that's EPR. Now we move on to Urban, which is um, a large piece of legislation uh, focused on patients. Came in just for Christmas in 2017. So in Irma, the key thing is it defines four what's called duty holders, and they're the people responsible for implementing these regulations. So the employer has overall responsibility to ensure that um, all the exposures are still more good than harm. Then you've got um, the referrer, and they're the people that request the radiation exposures. They have to give enough detail of why that exposure is necessary to allow this practitioner in order for them to justify the exposure. And the operator is the person that actually does the exposure. And then the other um, duty holder involved is the medical physics expert. So we're responsible for ensuring everything is optimized um, and helping to write all the different documentation you need to kind of prove compliance to um, this legislation. So the key thing with IRMA is justification. So every use of radiation must be just justified. And crucially, it must do more harm than good. Um, so it must be very low risk and very high benefit um, because of use of medical purposes, and um, that's how it's justified. As part of the kind of the MP role, um, we like to optimize these images. So as Mehdi already mentioned, we want to ensure that all the doses that we give to patients are as low as reasonably practicable or a LARP. Um, so that can be kind of just using the equipment properly, um, as we've already mentioned, using right exam, right patient, and also getting the lowest, giving the lowest um, injection possible, lowest activity of nuclear medicine or PET, to get a clinically effective image quality. Obviously, if you give the patients a huge injection, huge effective dose, you'll get stunning images, or you could scan them super quickly, but that may not be necessary. So you need to, ways of assessing what's um, needed for that particular patient and that particular indication. So typically, um, we do part of this by phantom scanning. So this is um, a NEMA image quality phantom. This is what it looks like scanned. So you can see it's got cold lesions, hot lesions, so we use this to assess how um, different image reconstructions are performing so we can kind of optimize the settings that are used on that scanner. That's kind of what's historically been used. We try and use more kind of uh, realistic um, phantoms where we can. So this is a 3D printed phantom called Abdomen um, made at the ICR um, where you have a kind of 3D printed liver, different lesions that you can insert into it. Um, and for this particular project, we're looking at and the effect of respiratory motion. So as patients breathe, so putting this on a, a motion platform that moves the phantom with a kind of a typical patient's uh, respiration allowed you kind of to can see the liver. This is kind of a hot rim and cold necrotic center. So you can kind of really test out the imaging and find the best reconstruction settings um, for that particular indication that the protocol that you're setting up. And this example for PET, where this is our kind of, was our kind of image quality. <coughs> And then we worked together with the manufacturer, we optimized it. And this is developing and um, correct information. So you can see these lesions are much more sharper than they were in this previous one. So the application of IRMA to um, research exposures. So a key thing is how you define an actual research exposure. So it's any exposure required by the research protocol following initial consent from the participant. So therefore it includes all exposures carried out on participants and by the protocol, including those which would be part of routine clinical care if they weren't in the, the clinical study. So it's quite critical within the IRS form to list all these different exposures um, out. 
So within AMA, um, in terms of research specific, we have to ensure that the individuals are informed in advance about the risk, uh, particularly from the research exposures. So that's typically done through the patient information sheet. Also, individuals participate voluntary, approved by a rep. Um, they still need to be justified by a dental practitioner, uh, typically a radiologist. And for um, nuclear medicine, often that's the RSAC practitioners and RSAC license holder, which we'll come on to. And some research studies also we're doing patients um, as normal volunteers, so then you have to, the practitioner will have to pay particular attention to those cases. So looking at the IRS form it, itself, um, so there's part B section three is the bit that um, physics um, would always look at. This is the key bit which determines what um, you're doing, both in terms of CT and nuclear medicine of your investigation. Um, so here's an example from our fig oxide exemplar where it's a brain PET CT, F dopa. This is the activity we're recommending we give, how many administrations you give, um, and the effective dose. And the key is in this section, you have to include all the different nuclear medicine um, ice chips that you're injecting. As I said, whether they're standard of care or research only, you say later on which is specified as research or standard of care. Um, and there's another part where you list all the different procedures that the patient has. These two must match. Typically, lots of um, when we review kind of sites before we open with an Oxford, um, this is typically the problem that sometimes comes up is where there's an issues um, with the number of things listed within A1 compared to um, the A19, which is all the different procedures that have to take place. So this um, reduction material bit and dose bit is all completed by your kind of lead MP and the lead CRE, which is clinical radiation expert. So the clinical radiation expert, um, they assess whether the protocol could involve any additional radiation exposure um, and they advise the CI and the rec on the suitability and the ethical acceptability of these additional exposures. They should be a registered medical dental pro uh, professional, um, crucially with clinical expertise in that specific modality, be it nuclear medicine, PET, X-ray um, or radiotherapy. Um, CRE can be on the research team um, and they're based in the UK because it needs knowledge of um, And this is again for our um, big study, what we had. So in this case, a nice short series, just saying the radiation dose from the additional PET scan is of no clinical significance to patients with chiro. So they take into consideration the patient group that you're, you're um, scanning or treating as to um, the clinical impact for that specific group of people. Uh, moving on to the MP, so um, we will perform what's kind of a dose risk assessment for all the different radiation exposures um, proposed in the protocol. Um, and we state whether these are kind of standard of care or additional so that the rec can easily see which, um, what's the patient would get normally and what by taking part of this trial, what's the additional radiation exposure they're getting. Again, it needs to be an MP that has expertise relevant to that specific procedure. Um, and often, especially in nuclear medicine, where we have spec CT or PET CT, you therefore need a nuclear medicine PET MP as well as a diagnostic radiology CT MP to be involved in this risk assessment. So this is again the one for our Oxford exemplar. Um, so you can see it's a little bit longer than the um, CRE. So we've made it clear that it, um, it does require exposures to ionizing radiation. This is what the CT component is. This is what the nuclear medicine component is. Um, equivalent to 2.3 years of na average natural background radiation in the UK. Um, and as Mickey mentioned, the background radiation, like we've gone through what the different aspects that um, has, but also to bear in mind, say someone like Cornwall, the natural background there is about 7 millisieverts a year. So this is average across the whole of the UK background. Obviously, it's less than if you had a year in Cornwall. And the statement that kind of key that goes into your patient information sheet is saying um, the risk of development cancer consequences of taking part in the study is this percentage, tiny 0.03%. And then you always need to add in like for comparison, the natural lifetime cancer incidence within the UK is about 50%. And you can see here, this is then done by DR, was done by my colleague James, and then I did the nuclear resin part. So often for more complex studies where there's radiotherapy as well, you have three different MPs listed. Um, only one of them will sign off, but you will kind of are listed there to kind of take responsibility for your your bit that you've written. So within the um, reddish reviews, obviously it's crucial that the MP reassessment reflects the patient pathway um, and this patient information sheet needs to include similar information so that the patient can be fully informed about the risk of participation. And there's different guidance on HR website about 
what that um, statement should be, and it depends on, partly on the prognosis of the patient groups that you're examining as to how you should phrase that um, risk, radiation really risk to the patient. So how do we comply with these um, IRMA requirements? So individuals are informed in advance about the risks and radiation exposures. This is through the patient information sheet. Participate voluntary, through obviously research consent that we would do. Um, approved by ethics committee, our IRMA form when it gets signed off. Procedure justified by own practitioner, and it's made clear when you kind of refer patients how that's done. Um, again, on the IRMA form, there are kind of normal volunteers. We have that included, and within the um, IRMA section, we say what the dose constraints and target doses are to deliver the, the protocol and the doses that we've assessed. So there's different ways of doing your um, radiation assessment. So the kind of MP area I've just kind of shown of we've done locally through Oxford and you can do through your own institutions. Um, HRA have now launched uh, kind of a national radiation insurance program. So um, I take part of this in this as well. They've got like a list of national kind of approved MPs and CREs and we get allocated kind of different studies randomly throughout the year. Um, and you uh, sent all the documents and you have to write your MP assessment for that specific bit. Um, the disadvantage of these is oft, often the MP and CRE aren't necessarily in the same place. So whereas with local kind of approvals, we can kind of check with each other how we're doing it. Um, with this, because it's kind of picked from a list, it can be fairly random. Typically, if we're asked to do one, we try and make sure at least within like nucleus or the CT one, it's the same site MP. But I've been involved in a study recently where the there's three MPs um, because it's involving a lot of different uh, modalities. All three of us are in different places in the UK. So it's a lot of emails back and forth to agree kind of the final statement. Um, but this is kind of typically what they kind of push lots of people to, to, to use. And it works quite well. Um, it's 500 pounds plus that per specialty. So if you've got lots of different modalities within your trial, that can get quite expensive. Whereas typically kind of local MPs um, depending on your site when they do the um, assessment for you, that can be cheaper. So it depends on your trial as to what um, system you want to use. And another big aspect, especially for us in nucleus and PET, is RSAC. So for whatever trial you need, you want to do with a nuclear medicine, you have to get RSAC um, approval for that um, use of red nuclides. So under the old um, regulations, it used to be there was a practitioner certificate and they had separate certificates for diagnosis, for therapy, and for research. And for every single research trial, we used to have to send off a paper copy, wet signed um, to RSAC to get back and keep track of all this paper and getting all the paperwork was a complete pain for everyone. Um, so as part of over 2017, this was all um, improved and modernized. So now there's um, what's termed a split license approach. So there's an employer license and a practitioner license. So your employer license um, allows us to do it at specific sites. So in Oxford's case, at the JR, the Churchill Hospital sites. So there's a list of the red nuclides that we're allowed to inject and treat people with on each site. Um, and as part of the, kind of the application process, they check um, the staffing that's available, the experience at the site, and what equipment you've got. And then there's a separate license, the practitioner has a, a license um, and their single license will cover them for diagnostic therapy therapy and research um, and the license stays with that practitioner so if a practitioner works at a couple of different hospitals they don't need a new um, license for every hospital which is what we needed before and um, both of these are valid for five years you still have the sponsor um, pra approval so for each sponsor each trial the sponsor will get an RSEC approval um, letter license which can then be sent to the employer and practitioner for that each site individually for them to kind of see that RSEC have agreed it. And this is typically what they look like. So when they've been kind of authorised, when it expires, who did it, um, and it lists a whole lot, long list of procedure codes, of red nuclides, what you're allowed to do, what the indication is, and crucially here, whether it's authorised for research. It may be you've got certain um, procedure codes that you don't have for research, most institutions will have anything they can do diagnostically, they'd want to do research wise as well. Uh, but it means it's much easier if you've got a research trial that comes up, whereas in the past we used to have to always do an application to RSAC to get a new certificate for that specific research trial. Now there's a new um, research trial that comes on. Often they involve FDG PET, bone scans, GFRs, 
uh, market. Those are the kind of the four biggest ones that are used for all research trials. But if our practitioner already has it authorized to research and it's on our site license authorized research, we don't need locally any additional um, RSAC license. You wouldn't still need the overall study um, RSAC approval, but you don't need any specific license for that um, red nuclide. Where you do need to apply to RSAC is if it's kind of a novel red nuclide or red nuclide that you haven't used before on your own site, then you have to apply to RSAC um, to have it on your floor license and your practitioner license. Updating practitioner license with new procedure codes is free. Updating your employer license for new procedure codes you have to pay for. Um, so the trick is if you know what trials are coming up, you can kind of can do as many kind of updates as possible in one employer application to kind of save yourself a bit of bit of money. So with that, thanks for listening and any questions.